Welcome to the Sally May First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants have been placed in a listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions following the prepared remarks. If you would like to ask a question at that time, please press the star and one on your telephone keypad. If at any point your question has been answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star and two. So that others can hear your questions clearly, we ask that you pick up your handset for best sound quality. Lastly, if you should require operator assistance, please press star zero. I would now like to turn the call over to Melissa Brano, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, David. Good evening, and welcome to Sally Mae's first quarter 2024 earnings call. It is my pleasure to be here today with John Witter, our CEO, and Pete Graham, our CFO. After the prepared remarks, we will open the call for questions. Before we begin, keep in mind our discussion will contain predictions, expectations, and forward-looking statements. Actual results in the future may be materially different from those discussed here due to a variety of factors. Listeners should refer to the discussion of those factors in the company's form, SINQ, and other filings with the SEC. For Sally May, these factors include, among others, results of operations, financial conditions, and or cash flows, as well as any potential impacts of various exter external factors on our business. We undertake no obligation to update or revise any predictions, expectations, or forward-looking statements to reflect events or circumstances that occur after today, Wednesday, April 24th, 2024. Thank you, and now I'll turn the call over to John. Thank you, Melissa and David. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss Sally May's first quarter 2024 results. I'm pleased to report on a successful quarter and progress towards our 24 goals. I hope you'll take away three key messages today. First, we're off to a fast start in 2024. Second, we're encouraged by the trends we have seen in our credit performance. And third, we believe we have positive momentum for the rest of the year. Let's begin with the quarter's results. GAAP diluted EPS in the first quarter of 24 was $1.27 per share as compared to $0.47 cents in the year-ago quarter. Our results for the first quarter were driven by a combination of strong business performance, improvement in credit trends, and the gain on our first loan sale of the year. Loan originations for the first quarter of 24 were $2.6 billion which is up 6% over the first quarter of 23. We have seen our application volume grow as well, increasing 4% year over year. We believe that this is a solid start to 2024. Credit quality of originations was consistent with past years. Our co-signer rate for the first quarter of 24 was 91% versus 89% in the first quarter of 2023. Average FICO score for the first quarter of 2024 was 748 versus 746 in the first quarter of 2023. The credit improvement that we observed in 2023 has continued through the first quarter of 2024. Net private education loan charge-offs in Q1 were 83 million, representing 2.14% of average loans and repayments. This is down 29 basis points from fourth quarter of 2023 and better than expectations. Although we are still in the early stages of implementation, we are pleased with the medium term performance of our loss mitigation programs and are seeing improvement in our role to default rates, as well as positive performance trends in all stages of delinquency. As we mentioned in our year end call, we did see a rise in delinquencies in the fourth quarter due to what we described at that point as the mechanical results of borrowers entering into new payment programs who were in their qualifying period. We have added additional disclosure around both our delinquency and forbearance metrics and are seeing the desired results. Excluding those borrowers that are in their loan modification qualifying period, Delinquencies are down quarter over quarter from 3.1% in Q1 of 2023 
to 2.7% in Q1 of 2024. Loans in disaster or hardship forbearance were 1% at the end of Q1 2024, consistent with performance in Q1 of 23. The $2.1 billion loan sale that we were able to execute in the first quarter generated $143 million in gains. We are encouraged by the price we received, which is in line with our expectations. We still expect to sell additional loans in 2024, with market conditions dictating the timing and our balance sheet growth targets dictating the volume. The balance sheet growth expectations for the year remains at 2 to 3 percent. In the first quarter of 2024, we continued our capital return strategy by repurchasing 1.3 million shares at an average price of $20.32. We have reduced the shares outstanding since we began this strategy in 2020 by just over 50 percent at an average price of $15.95. We expect to continue to use the gain and capital release from future loan sales to programmatically and strategically buy back stock throughout the year. Pete will now take you through some additional financial highlights of the quarter. Pete? Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Before we jump into the key drivers of earnings for the quarter, I wanted to mention a change to our guidance metrics that you may have noticed in our earnings release and investor presentation. We have discontinued reporting non-GAAP core earnings and its related metrics, as it has been identical to our GAAP earnings last eight quarters, including this quarter. As such, for purposes of our 2024 guidance, we are now using GAAP earnings in place of non-GAAP core earnings in the calculation of the earnings per common share metric. However, the guidance range is unchanged at $2.60 to $2.70. Now for a discussion of key drivers of earnings. Year after year, our quality loan portfolio generates significant net interest income. For the first quarter of 2024, we earned $387 million of net interest income. This is down 4% from the prior year quarter and level with the fourth quarter of 2023. Although average yields of interest earning assets are up about 45 basis points over the year ago quarter, average interest earning asset balances are down slightly which resulted in a $26 million decrease in interest income from the year-ago period. Interest expense was $44 million higher as borrowing rates increased approximately 75 basis points from the prior year. Net interest margin for the first quarter was 5.5% compared to 5.7% in the year-ago quarter. And we continue to believe over the long term that low to mid 5% is the appropriate min target. Our total provision for credit losses in the income statement was $12 million first quarter of 2024. This is comprised of an increase in provision of $145 million related to volume and prepayment assumption updates, offset by a release of $133 million associated with the $2.1 billion loan sale we completed during the quarter. The majority of the increase to provision is related to origination volume during the mini peak that occurs in the first quarter of each year. Additionally, we reduced our long-term prepayment assumption, which accounted for approximately 26% of the increase during the quarter. Although this change in assumption has a negative impact on provision, this is a long-term positive as we will continue to keep our interest earning assets on a balance sheet for a longer period of time. Net charge-offs for our private education loan portfolio in the first quarter were $83 million, or 2.1%, consistent with the year-ago quarter. Our private education loan reserve at the end of the first quarter is $1.4 billion, or 6.1% of our total student loan exposure, which includes the on-balance sheet portfolio plus the accrued interest receivable of $1.4 billion. Our reserve rate shows improvement over the 6.4% in the prior year quarter, 
and is consistent with levels at the end of 2023. Private education loans delinquent 30 days or more, 3.4% of loans in repayment, a decrease from 3.9% at the end of 2023, and consistent with the 3.4% at the end of the year go quarter. As John mentioned earlier, we've refined our disclosure around both delinquencies and forbearance to get more visibility into our credit performance. When adjusting the numbers that I just discussed to remove the borrowers who were in a three-month qualifying period related to one of our new programs, the improvement in delinquencies is compelling. At the end of the first quarter, loans delinquent 30 days or more becomes 2.7% loans in repayment as compared to 3.2% at the end of 2023 and 3.1% in the year ago quarter. We believe that this is a medium-term indicator of the success of the new programs and will continue to monitor and disclose performance in the coming quarters. First quarter operating expenses were $160 million, compared to $143 million in the prior quarter and $155 million in the year ago quarter. This was a 4% increase compared to the first quarter of 2023. The majority of this increase relates to increase in volume in the quarter compared to the prior year, with applications increasing 4% and disbursements increasing 6%. Total non-interest expenses in the first quarter were $162 million compared to $202 million in the prior quarter and $157 million in the year ago quarter. Finally, our liquidity and capital positions are solid. We ended the quarter with liquidity of 19.1% of total assets. At the end of the first quarter, total risk-based capital was 13.5%, and common equity tier one capital was 12.3%. Another measure of the loss absorption capacity of the balance sheet is gap equity plus loan loss reserves over risk-rated assets, which was a very strong 16.2%. We believe we're well positioned to continue to grow our business and return capital to shareholders going forward. I'll now turn the call back to John. Thanks, Pete. I hope you agree that we have executed well in the first quarter and that you share my belief that we have positive momentum for the full year 2024. There has been some question about the potential implications of delays and technical issues associated with the Department of Education's launching of the new FAFSA form. At this point, we do not believe that these issues will cause material impact on volume, but may likely condense an already short peak season. Externally, we continue to partner with our schools to assist families through this process. Through the calculation tools available on our website, our scholarship search capabilities available through Scholarly and other materials we provide to families, we are there to help make this peak season as frictionless as possible. Internally, we are preparing for a condensed peak with enhanced staffing, improved digital and other self-service capabilities, and other actions. While early, we are also paying attention to the impact of one of our major competitors exiting the market. We believe this will afford the opportunity to compete for new business. While too early to declare definitively, early analysis suggests a slight volume increase from borrowers that previously had a relationship with that competitor. We expect to see the first real signs of opportunity during peak season over the summer and into the fall. In addition to our originations growth in the first quarter, Pete also mentioned the continuation of slower prepayment speeds, both of which are positives for balance sheet growth and interest income as we look toward the second quarter of the year. We will continue to focus on operational execution, expense management, and NIM to drive results. Let me conclude with a discussion of 2024 guidance. As I mentioned earlier this evening, we are encouraged by both the successful Q1 origination season the positive trends we are seeing with credit performance and our first loan sale execution of the year. We are also optimistic that these things will lead to a successful 2024. We believe the medium term success of our programs will continue to normalize and we'll look forward to updating you on that performance progress throughout the year. 
At this time, we are reaffirming the 2024 guidance that we communicated on our last earnings call for all key metrics. With that, Pete, let's go ahead and open up the call for some questions. The floor is now open for questions. At this time, if you have a question or comment, please press star and one on your telephone keypad. If at any point your question is answered, you may remove yourself from the queue by pressing star and two. Again, we ask that you pick up your handset when posing your question to provide optimal sound quality. Our first question is coming from Sanjay Sakrani with KBW. Please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, this is actually Stephen Clark filling in for Sanjay. Thanks for taking my questions. I, I guess like the first question I have is just around the uh, the quarter relative to your original expectations. How did the uh, the quarter come in? Just because you're trying to tie that back to your guidance um, that was maintained. Was it that the quarter was in line, or was it better than expectations, but that it's early in the year and thus you're maintaining your guidance? Thanks. Yeah, I'd say it's largely in line with what, what we expected it would be. And, um, you know, although there's some positive trends and developments in the quarter, as, as John said, um, you know, it's, it's so early in the year. So we'll, we'll wait and see how things develop uh, over the coming quarters, but we feel good about the start. Got it. And, and then just around the credit side, it's nice to see that the, the credit trends are um, trending positively. Uh, just as we look at the reserve rate, like how, over as your credit metrics continue to improve, how should we think about you know what the reserve rate can get to over time? Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that we're ready to call a number for the for the absolute reserve rate over time, but I think it it um, it makes sense that as we continue to see improvements in you know, credit credit metrics like charge-offs, et cetera, that we would continue to see, you know, modest improvements in the overall level of reserves that we're required to put up. I think that coupled with, you know, the changes in underwriting that we've we've made and we continue to sort of tweak each year, um, the, the origination quality is, is very strong. Uh, and that'll, that'll manifest itself over time as well. Great. Thanks for taking my question. We'll take our next question from Terry Ma with Barclays. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, so, so it looks like you're getting some pretty positive results from your loan mod programs. Um, can you maybe just talk about what more um, you need to see or what more has to happen before um, you get some more confidence in um, kind of updating your guide for the year? Yeah, Terry, it's John. I'll take that one. Um, you know, as, as you indicated, we are uh, very pleased with the progress uh, and the results that we've seen so far. You know, all of the metrics that we can look at at the early stages of a customer entering a loan mod, you know, are meeting or, you know, modestly exceeding our expectations. So, you know, examples of those types of metrics would be things like, you know, what is the success rate of people making their qualifying, you know, their three qualifying payments. So, so we like all of that. And I think, you know, we sort of described it as, uh, you know, sort of positive medium-term results. Uh, you know, ultimately, though, the real proof here is, you know, do folks graduate from their programs you know, do they enjoy strong financial success, you know, on the other side of those programs? Uh, and I think that's just something that we will gain more and more confidence in with each passing month and each passing quarter. Uh, but I think given it was still relatively early stages, uh, I think we felt like uh, we wanted to see a bit more of that seasoning uh, before we thought about updating guidance. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. We'll take our next question with Jeff Adelson from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hey, good evening, guys. Um, thanks for taking my questions. Um, yeah, just along the same lines of, of credit, um, I guess, you know, as we look at the increased use of these mods and the extended grace periods, 
Um, maybe are there any kind of metrics you can point us to in the success rates? I know you just alluded to that, um, how you're seeing uh, qualifying payments, et cetera. But, but I guess I'm just wondering if you look at, I don't know if this is the right way to look at it, but if you look at the delinquency rate, the percent in extended grace period and the percent in hardship forbearance, that number has gone up versus a year ago. So um, how do you give us you know, that confidence that those are going to perform as expected um, and help your credit even in a year from now and you know, you're not just putting them into a, a bucket where the default rate isn't going to show up for now? Yeah. Jeff, look, fair, fair question. Uh, you know, we can certainly go away and think about is there additional disclosure that we want to make there. Uh, we have not done that to date. Uh, you know, certainly rest assured, you know, we look very hard at those very metrics internally. Uh, those are the very same metrics that we then project out forward when we start to think about guidance for the year as well as the long-term normalization of guidance, you know, sort of back to the 1.9 to 2.1 percent range, uh, you know. But ultimately, you know, the way that we're all going to get comfortable with that is to see these programs fully season over the next several quarters, uh, and get back to that target delinquency rate that we think is the right delinquency and, and that charge-off rate for us to be shooting for. So, uh, so we'll, we'll think about the question of additional uh, sort of disclosure. Thank you for that. Uh, but I think we feel very comfortable that what we're seeing is consistent with the guidance that we have given. Okay, got it. And, and just to circle back on the, the comment about your, your competitor exiting, um, you kind of alluded to a slight benefit from their existing customer showing interest. Um, I, I guess, why, why wouldn't there be a more meaningful benefit? I mean, you've got the peak summer season coming with, you know, freshmen going to school. It, it seems like it might be more meaningful than just more of a, a slight or uh, modest benefit given their presence in the market before? Yeah, Jeff, um, you know, I think the way I would explain that is, you know, you have to remember that the competitor in question did not leave the market until after they had fulfilled, you know, their, uh, you know, their commitments and sort of uh, made the opportunity, you know, for the spring loans that they had already committed to. Uh, so, you know, I think we talk often about the fact that in our business, spring follows fall, fall doesn't follow spring. You know, that uh, sort of, you know, second semester follow-on business, the die is largely cast for that in, uh, in the first quarter. So I think we've been extremely consistent in saying we expected there to be really very little impact of this strategic move by this competitor until we got to the summer peak season. Uh, I think we were pleasantly surprised at the, you know, sort of the modest improvement and, uh, you know, sort of uh, additional incremental business that we saw there when we looked at, you know, customers that had existing relationships with this competitor, because quite frankly, we really weren't expecting any in, in the spring semester. Um, I think, you know, to your second question of why you wouldn't see more, I think it's because the peak season for kids going back to school in the fall really doesn't start till June at the earliest, uh, and really gets going in earnest in July and August. And so uh, I think we'll start to have an early read of that just to set expectations in the, you know, second quarter earnings, but I think it will still be preliminary. Uh, I think where we will really sort of fully understand uh, sort of the benefit and our success in competing for this new business is when we report out on peak performance, which has obviously uh, always been a third quarter type of uh, type of conversation. Great. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. We'll take our next question from John Hecht with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Afternoon. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Just looking at margin, NIM, um, it looks like, you know, the, well, the direct-to-consumer deposits are stabilizing. Um, I'm wondering, kind of, given the yield curve outlook, what we should think about, you know, the NIM kind of fluctuations as I think you have about two-thirds fixed-rate loans and one-third adjustable-rate loans. And so, you know, maybe you could kind of give us some details about kind of how the reset period looks for that group um, and then – thinking about kind of CD maturities um, and repricing of that, 
what we should think about kind of the cost of liabilities and, and, and how that affects NIM over the next few quarters? Yeah, I, I don't necessarily want to get into all of the mechanical parts of it, but what I would say is when we originally set our guidance, we were expecting five rate cuts this year. Um, and uh, we also talked about, uh, you know, in the last call that we're mildly asset sensitive uh, and then and then flip to being liability sensitive over a longer period of time. And so the sort of higher for longer, at least in the short term, is mildly beneficial to us because we'll we'll earn more on the asset side uh, over the over the near term as as those short term rates don't don't get lowered as quickly. So at at the margins it's probably net positive towards uh, towards NIM for the year and maybe the NIM compression that we anticipated happening doesn't happen as fast, but we'll wait and see how that develops over the course of the year. Okay, and then remind us or remind me when um the, the when the reset of uh, the adjustable rate occurs and what it's reset off of? Uh, so our loans um, are uh, SOFA based and largely, you know, sort of a monthly reset. Um, obviously, the deposits are you know set in in the market, uh, but generally referencing off of um, Fed funds or other short term rates, um, but competitively priced. Uh, in terms of deposit flows, um, and then the the, uh, the ABS is also SOFA based, um, but generally the reset periods uh, can be slightly longer on that. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks. Once again, if you have a question, you may press star and one on your telephone keypad. We'll take our next question from Rick Shang with J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks, everybody, for taking my question this afternoon. Um, look, I'd like to pull a little harder on the thread that uh, Jeff started, uh, which is thinking about sort of um, or how to calibrate for loans in modification. Um, I think it would be really helpful if you would show it, uh, as you show with the dollars of loans and forbearance, the dollars of loans in mod as well. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the migration we've seen this quarter. So if we go back to last quarter, implicitly there were about 70 basis points of loans that were uh, in the qualifying period. That's the difference between the 3.9 and the 3.2. Um, that represents, call it $105 million worth of loans. What percentage of that $105 million actually was successful uh, and emerged from that period into, uh, and is, is now fully modified. Yeah, Rick, I think the way uh, that I would think about it is um, a loan would only show up as being modified if they were successful at making their three qualifying uh, payments you know, and then they would go into and be counted as, you know, a modified loan for the duration of whatever that, you know, particular program was. So if it was a, um, you know, if it was a, you know, a short-term rate reduction, you know, that, that would be a certain time frame. If it were a longer-term program, that would be a different time frame. But you don't get, uh, you, you don't get counted in those, you know, those numbers uh, unless you've made your three qualifying payments. And if you fail to make your three qualifying pay payments, generally as a rule, you are put back into the delinquency bucket at the level that you would have been given that payment history. So it is a, in my mind, pretty clean test. You know, the customers that are in here are the ones that have been successful at qualifying for those payments over the course of a quarter, three months. Uh, and if you don't, you know, if you don't qualify, then you move very quickly back into uh, sort of the rest of the delinquency buckets and you continue to age and perform uh, as you would as a result. Got it. But, but here's what I'm trying to understand. So, uh, in, in correct me if I'm wrong, I understand that 2.7 this quarter, 3.2 last quarter, the difference between 
the 3.9 and the 3.2 last quarter to be people who have been offered loan modifications but have not yet met the three payment standard. So they are still showing up as delinquent, is delinquent, but the expectation is that if they meet that standard, they will migrate. And what I'm looking at is in the last quarter, there were $107 million specifically or implicitly of loans that were in that test period. This quarter, sequentially, delinquencies declined $90 million. So what I'm trying to understand is of that 107 that could have rolled through and improved your delinquencies, how much did that 107 contribute to the $90 million improvement we saw? Yeah, I understand that question. I don't think we have provided that level, Rick, of, of detail uh, and disclosure. Got it. Okay. Uh, I appreciate it. There, um, I'll just add, there's some additional, you know, sort of tabular disclosure on the dollar amounts of modifi in modification in footnote four. If you look at that and that doesn't give you what you need to do the calculation you're looking for, then you know, just reach back out to Melissa and we can we can dig into it more. Terrific. I appreciate that. And, and if, if I can indulge one last question, how do, when a loan is modified, how do the economics change? Does it, it presumably changes the cash flows. Does it change the gap of fools from an income perspective? Yeah, it, it will, because the modification will depend on which of the programs, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's uh, a rate-based rate program, whether it's, uh, you know, um, term-based program, term -based yeah. program, et cetera. And then, again, once those qualifying payments are made, they come out of the delinquency bucket and they go back into the book, and whatever the, the modified terms are will drive the accruals. Uh, hey, I realized I had some pretty uh, in-the-weeds questions. Thank you guys very much. Sure. We'll take our next question from John Arpstrom with RBC Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon. Hey, um, you guys made a comment about um, slower prepayment speeds, and i um, curious if that was a surprise at all for you, anything to read into that, and do you expect that to continue? No, it's, it's more just, um, you know, we – each time we run through the process, we look at recent performance trends, and we've seen, um, you know, over over the recent past, continuing improvement in the, the, the sort of overall level of lower levels of, of prepayment. And you know, as we looked at that trend and you know, kind of rolled that forward another quarter, um, it, it caused us to, to make a, a different uh, assumption regarding our longer term. Yeah, I'll look for, for prepayment. And John, I think the thing I would I would add, you know, because I think um, uh, we have seen there's a, a number of factors that influence prepayment. Obviously, rate environment is a big part of, of uh, the sort of calculus there. Uh, and so, you know, I think the changing rate outlook from the beginning of the year. You know, if you had said to me, if rates behave this way, you know, the way that they behaved, are, are you surprised that consolidations would have continued to slow? I would have said, no, I'm not surprised by that. Uh, I think we were all expecting at the beginning of the year a different rate environment, and I think that goes into the equation as well. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then just, just one more. Um, your, your stock's done well recently. I, I, I think you deserve it, but are, are we still in the green zone um, on the buyback, and just curious how aggressive you'd like to be on that, if you can provide us with any color in your thinking. Yeah, again, we, we assess that at each uh, point in time, uh, and as as you probably observed, the rates market's been fairly volatile, uh, you know, to, to start the year, um, and that'll be sort of a game-time call as we you know, evaluate timing of any any next transactions, but um, you know it, this this the transaction that we got done in the first quarter was was at a point in time when uh, 
know, when rates were a little, little more favorable than maybe they are on spot today, but expectation is as we move through this year that there will be other opportunities uh, that present themselves. I, I, I think I, I confused the question, Pete, but I was asking on the buyback, the share repurchase program, how aggressive you guys are. Yes, yeah, so as I said uh, in, the, in the last earnings call, you know, we're going to be more programmatic around uh, the buyback program this year. And so with the, um, you know, with the first uh, loan sale that we completed in the quarter, we you know, put a plan in place to, you know, to buy back shares. Um, and we're going to be programmatic across, uh, you know, to try and be in the market across uh, the trading days of the year this year. As opposed to in and out, uh, you know, uh, in periods of time. So. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. This does conclude the Q and A portion of today's call. I would now like to turn the floor over to Mr. John Witter for closing remarks. David, thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone who joined in and joined us this evening. Uh, you know, again, we are excited about the first quarter performance. I think we are excited about uh, the outlook for the year uh, and look forward to continuing to discuss our performance with you as the quarters unfold. Uh, as always, if there's more detailed questions or things that we didn't get to, please feel free to reach out to Melissa and our team and happy to follow up over the course of the next couple of days and until we talk to you next quarter. Uh, thank you again for your interest in Sally May. Have a great evening. And I'm sorry, Melissa, back to you for some closing business. <laughs> thank you for your time and questions today. A replay of this call and the presentation will be available on the investors page at sallymay.com. If you have any further questions, feel free to contact me directly. This concludes today's call. Thank you. This concludes today's Sally May first quarter 2024 for earnings conference call and webcast. Please disconnect your line at this time and have a wonderful evening.